My idea is that you don't get stressed and you don't feel overwhelmed from all the things you get done. I think you get to feel the overwhelm and the stress from all the things you tell yourself that you should be doing, but that you're not doing. So my name is Katrina Horn. I'm a life coach. And today I'm going to share with you my three-step process on how to get things done. And that's really anything from starting your own business to tidying a kitchen drawer. If this is your first time here, welcome, welcome. If you're used to being here and I can see that Rebecca just joined, well, welcome. You are free to use the chat. You can ask me questions or just comment if that helps you. I won't be reading it all the time because that will be distracting for me, but I will be sometimes looking over there. So if you've got no questions, I think we should just get on with it. So welcome if you're here live. Welcome if you're on the replay. Now, right now you might be thinking, well, I know what it is I should be doing. So why I'm not doing it? And I hope you're not telling yourself that it's because um, I'm lazy. I used to tell myself that. Or... Uh, I just don't know how to, or I'm too stupid, or any of those negative things that don't really help us. So I hope that this will show you, my process will show you exactly what is happening and that is preventing you from doing what it is you want to do or knowing that you must do so that you can really just lean back and enjoy your accomplishments. The procrastination that might be happening for you is not because, as I just said, you're lazy. There could be something different going on. And I hope today will show you exactly what. So if you're watching on the replay, I sent out a workbook that you can access beneath this video. If you're here live, you don't really need the workbook because I'll be sharing all of it here on my screen. Saying that, I'll just go ahead and share my screen. And as I said, feel free to comment or ask questions. So today we will have a look at the three reasons why you don't get things done. And it might not be what you think. Instead of talking about time management, I will be showing you energy management. And maybe you've already taken the survey I sent out with the info for this um, workshop. If you haven't, don't go and do it now. You can do it later. If you're on the replay, you might want to go and do it. And I'll link it somewhere near this video too. So you can go ahead and do it. And this um, assessment, I called it an energy management assessment, is really just for you to, to troubleshoot or to at least create awareness around where things or energy might be leaking out so that you spot those drainage factors on your energy so that you can do something about them. Because we are used to thinking in terms of energy, like, oh no, sorry, time, like, oh, I haven't got the time to do this. And that creates a lot of stress, that creates pressure because time is finite. We can't stretch it, we can't create more of it, we can't rewind it. So we are stuck with what we've got. So fighting against that time is not going to help you feel good and it's not going to help you get things done so I think it's much better to think about energy because energy you can generate energy maybe it's not infinite but you have got some power over your energy and that's what we'll be looking at too then we'll be doing um also part of my three-step process is to create your own success formula, which is part mindset and part very practical steps you can take today. And also another opportunity for you to take your first step. So moving along here, just making sure you can see my screen and I can see some of you. Um, let me move a few things around. As I was saying, the three reasons why you're not getting things done and they're not They've not got to do particularly with time. Time is an excuse. They haven't got anything to do with money. Money might be an excuse. All of those things we call surface level excuses. And there's some real reasons behind. So if 
first one is you don't believe it's possible. You're telling yourself it can't be done. Or maybe, hang on, I'm trying to get technology to work for me. <laughs> you don't believe it can be done for you. Or thirdly, you're afraid of the consequences. And that's really what we'll be diving into in this, in this section. So first off, belief. You could be asking yourself, why am I not doing it? And with anything to do with self-help, anything with self-development or becoming the best version of yourself or living more fully or being authentic, but however you want to look at it, when you ask yourself the question, why, you stay stuck because you can't answer that question. Why? Why am I not getting things done? Why am I feeling despondent? Why, why, why? It's not very useful to be asking that question because right now we might not know why. When we move forward, maybe we will find out why, why we were stuck in the past. But the why is not what will help propel us forward. So if we can just save the question why till later and ask how and what, we can actually do something about it. We can find a way, we can solve problems. So if you accept that, I came up with a few questions in our workbook, uh, which I'm going to share with you in step one. So it's workbook page one. If you're watching the replay, you can follow along in your workbook. Um, and if you're here live, just go with me, right? Step one in the workbook is all about creating awareness. So the questions are, how am I procrastinating? Or a different way of asking that question is, what does that look like? How am I procrastinating? What does that look like? Yeah, so I was just reading the comments. So think about that for you. And if you're here live, you might need a few more minutes than we've got here. But if you're on the replay, you can just pause because I'm going to suggest some answers. But think about what does it look like when you're procrastinating? What does it look like when you're not doing what you want to do and you're sort of, you're berating yourself? So you tell yourself off, perhaps. And you start feeling so bad that you start comfort eating or another form of buffering. Maybe you watch, you go over, you scroll through social media, you watch Netflix or the idea that you make yourself feel bad, then you want to compensate that feeling. That could be what it looks like for you. Or you lose patience with your children. I see a lot of mothers who blame themselves for losing patience with their children and start start yelling at them, you know, but let's just, instead of judging and instead of blaming, let's just take it apart and understand it. You could also blame your husband, thinking that he should be doing it. That's my favorite. I don't know which one is yours, but it's so convenient to have somebody else to blame, right? Oh, I shouldn't be doing this. He should be doing it. Do you know what I mean? So what does it look like to you? What's your particular flavor of not getting things done? And then ask yourself the question, what? What am I not getting done? So if you want to lose weight, you could be not eating what you know you should be eating. You could be leaving your house when what you really want to do is tidy up. You could be not applying for a new job if you want to get on in your career or just do something different or get a better job or a better paid job. Or a slightly more tricky one is that you could not be telling your spouse that you feel a bit bored watching television with him in the evening. So these could be some of the things that you're constantly putting off, telling yourself, oh, why don't I just do it? Or asking yourself, why don't I just do it? Then... Have a look at what am I telling myself? How am I justifying it is a different way of asking it. What am I telling myself? When we say that, we sort of distance ourselves from, from being so involved in it. And what I really want to 
for you to realize is that there is a there is an underlying belief that is informing your behavior that is wouldn't say controlling you but which is motivating you to not do something what is it that you are telling yourself how are you justifying this inaction this not getting things done so with weight loss you could be telling yourself there's no point because when I manage to lose weight I just put it on again just think of it if you want to lose weight if you don't believe you can do it well why would you take any disagreeable action on it why would you change what you eat why will you get any exercise if you don't feel like it if you've got a problem with with clutter if you don't if you're not a tidy person and you want to become one you could be telling yourself that i just don't know where to start i don't know right and often my clients tell me i don't know it's again because they ask you or they t ask themselves why i don't know so uh, I tell myself it's too complicated if you're looking for a new job that I'll have to find references, contact people. I'm afraid of asking for help. Now that happens so often. Just that fear of perhaps rejection will keep us stuck, won't it? And what we're doing now is not trying to force ourselves to do something we don't want to do. What we're doing now is just creating awareness also, if you think about my um, my example with the husband that you're feeling bored watching television with, you could be telling yourself that I'm risking my marriage. I don't know what will happen when I tell him. I haven't got any other things to suggest. So better not say anything. So these could be the the reasons you're not really taking any actions. It's not that you're feeling lazy or it's not that you don't know how, it's that you're thinking, mm, I don't believe that this can be done. I don't believe that if I do something, it will get me the desired outcome. So I'm back to the three reasons again, why you're not getting things done. So in question number four in your workbook, have a look at the belief behind it. So, in the first example, it is, I can't lose weight permanently. And that is really what's preventing you from changing anything in your eating habits, in your health routine, in your exercise program, right? You've got that going somewhere in your system. I can't lose weight permanently. So no use in getting started. I'll, it won't happen. If, it, if I do meet with a little success, I will... I will stop it. I will self-sabotage or something like that. Also, in my example from the tidying your house, your belief is it's the job is too big. It can't be done. Or I don't know how to do it. It could also be I don't want to ask for the help. I really want. For the job, my job example of um, asking for or applying for a new job, could be I'm unwilling to hear no from people I ask for help from, right? That would be a bit painful, wouldn't it? To ask somebody, oh, could you give me a hand here? And then hear no. So that could be stopping you. Many people are stopped off or stopped from doing or asking for help because they really deep down fear rejection. Also, in my husband example and the television, if you remember, he won't agree with me, and this will create insurmountable problems in my marriage. Now, who would want to take action on any of that? All right? So these beliefs are what keep you stuck. I don't know for you if you've got any idea of what your particular belief is that is really running the show. What is it that you firmly believe and that is stopping you? stopping you from taking any action, right? This belief is what we must address. And we do that in uh, the third step of my process. But right now we've created awareness around, around it. We know that there's something stopping us. And if you want to, you can share it in the chat. So if you are already aware that there's some underlying belief that is stopping you from doing what it is you want to do, go ahead, put it in the chat.
So there's a belief stopping you. And there's also probably an emotion that you're trying to avoid, but we won't go into that today. Um, we can do so later, perhaps. I'll tell you how. But uh, right now, let's just stay with the belief. And when I think about that, I had a client who had that declutter problem in her house. Well, that was not why she came to me, but she found out that she had so much clutter in her house and that was sort of weighing her down. So she felt overwhelmed and she didn't enjoy being at home because there's just too much stuff going going on, right? She didn't feel, she felt it was difficult to clean her house and she didn't feel at ease in it just because of all the stuff, right? We've all experienced that. So she was telling herself, um, I can't do it. It's too, the job is too big. I don't want to do it, right? I don't know where to get started and all of that. But I didn't actually get her started because I challenged her to declutter just one thing and that was in her bedroom, in her underwear drawer. So her homework was to go and tidy up her underwear drawer. That was all, right? Start in one place, just this little job. And as she was also losing weight with me, there was so much underwear she didn't even fit anymore. Like it was just totally inappropriate for her now. And there was tons of it and she didn't wear it and she didn't like it and she didn't look good in it. And it wasn't even her size. So her underwear drawer just went from being bulging with lots of unuseful things to being really tidy. And that inspired her. So not only did she do her underwear drawer, she went on to do some more drawers. So getting rid of all those clothes that we keep, we don't know why, but we do know why, but actually we don't do anything about it. They're just there. And it gets to be so overwhelming because getting dressed becomes just like a task. Like I just take the top thing because I can't be bothered to go through all of it. And so actually we started with a bedroom because my idea is that if we've got one place in the house that we feel really good in, well, then we can feel really good, right? Just focus on one place. And I think the bedroom is such a good place to start. So she tidied up her whole bedroom, not in one go, right? Over time, she tidied up her whole bedroom and she got, she also got rid of some furniture because there was just too much stuff in there. And she got in some more, some things that were more in alignment with her now. So she was into candles and a holistic medicine and, and all of that nice smelling candles and what have you. So she got some of that in and she just started looking at it as a cocoon. So even though the rest of her house wasn't, wasn't spotless and wasn't tidy, she had that area. And now she could keep that area completely tidy. Do you see what I mean? So, yes, that's a very good point. So in the, in the comments, we've got attached to a specific outcome. Yeah, avoid failure or feeling of wrongness. So that is... That is a little bit perfectionistic. So I'm talking from experience. When we are attached to a specific outcome, we have actually got it in our power to influence the outcome, right? So there's also a question of lack of belief in oneself when we think that, oh, I won't be able to create exactly that. So very, very good to have created this awareness. We will change that around in step three. Also, somebody else says it's both about cleaning the house and changing my job. Yeah, it feels too big. Right. So too big can't be done or can't be done by me is what you're saying. Right. Something needs to happen before this can happen. Right. So we're putting conditions on something happening for us, which is, of course, not always useful. So I'm moving on. I'm going to talk to you about time versus energy, except that we've got another comment on here. You started to, yes, welcome. I hadn't, didn't see you joined us. So I've wanted to start an online business for years, but I've been procrastinating because it seems silly and not viable. Yes. So how, how could you possibly take any action on feeling silly and not viable? Yeah. Okay, so I'd really love to talk more about this with you. Um, yeah, I know. I mean, I was in, in your situation exactly, and I've got so much to say 
on that subject, I won't say your name in case you want to be anonymous for the replay, but I so hear you, right? And I would love to chat with you about this later, but I'm moving on um, right now, but I'll get back to you later. So time versus energy, when we think about time, this will take so long, why get started, right? I'm 56 and I've still got things I want to accomplish in my life, but I could be telling myself, oh, it's too late, right? 56, phew, why bother? There's not enough time. Or you could be telling yourself something similar, but on a daily basis, I haven't got the time to tidy. I haven't got the time to rewrite my CV. I haven't got the time to whatever. And that is not very useful. And that's why I wanted to do a, um, a, um, an assessment that could help guide you to the areas where you are not refueling on your energy because instead of telling us or asking yourself how much time do I need to accomplish this task you could be asking yourself how much energy will I need for this job and when we think when we think in terms of energy we have claimed our power back because we can generate energy and as I said before we can't create more time like there are 24 hours in the day for all of us but what we can do is both stop the leakages of energy in our lives and create the habits that will refuel that energy, both on a day-to-day -day basis, but perhaps even in your life experience. And that's really what my next point is going to be about. So let's not focus on the time aspect. As I said, it is an excuse. We might find it really real, but telling yourself, I'm not doing this because I haven't got the time is never the exact truth. It might be a factor, but it's never the whole truth. So let's start thinking in terms of energy. And that's really what my next point in the workbook is all about. There are four sources of energy or way to create energy. There's a body, physical energy. Just think about it when you've had a good night's rest, when you've had, slept perhaps eight hours. Perhaps you feel really good and everything seems a lot easier the next day. You need less time to do something. You need less time to do complicated things. And perhaps you need, you need less time just to tidy up after breakfast, right? Everything feels easier. So there's this idea of physical energy in the body. Then you've got your emotions. Now, your energy might be leaking out all over the place through unprocessed emotions. So you can train your mind to focus elsewhere than on the negative. And this is just one example, and we'll be going into a few more. But just to know that emotions are a huge potential energy drain. It's We're not talking only physical energy here, we're talking mental energy. And often it's a mental energy that's stopping us really from getting things done. You've got your mind, what's happening in your mind, focus, creating discipline around distractions. And I find that um, technological distractions now are major. People are so easily distracted. They've got those notifications going on all the time. And maybe you, you are very well aware that we can't really multitask a cute computer can multitask because it's got two processors or more, but we've only got one brain. So we think we're being more efficient when we multitask. So we think it's efficient to answer emails the minute they arrive instead of batching them. But what happens when you're answering your emails the minute they arrive, you're taking your mind of what you're doing onto the email and you need a little time to take that in, answer it, deal with it, and then you want to focus back on what you were doing. And then again, you're wasting time and not only time. My point here is that you're wasting the energy. So it's so much more tiring to go from one task to the next, to back to the first, to another. Going around like that is an energy drain. So I'm sure you've got lots of things to tell me on that score and, and feel free to put them in the chat. But I think it's really a question of creating discipline around it and creating different uh, expectations from people who send you emails, just in my email example. 
I think also it's so nice when, oh, oh, I've got a friend on Facebook who's pinging me now. Uh, I'm doing something I don't perhaps enjoy doing. So it's so tempting just to go off there and have a look at what's happening and, and seeing what your friend is posting and all of that. So you're free to put in your comments in the chat and I'd love to read them. So spirit, for, um, for example, you can, you can create more energy if you feel that you belong somewhere, if you feel safe in your environment, if you feel integrated, like you've got a connection to people. And then you can always uh, look at the activities you have where you feel that you are on purpose, that there's a sense to what you're doing. It gives you meaning. So these are just some examples of how you can generate energy. But let's have a look at the habits that will create that energy because it's not enough to know it, is it? It's not enough to know that if you went to bed at 10 and got up at 6.30 to do 15 minutes of, of exercise, that that would do wonders to your life. You actually have to do it then, right? We can't stop at the theory. We have to take it out into real life. So that's what we'll be doing in step two. Uh, and if you're watching on the replay, please turn to page two of your workbook. So what that will look like, I invite you to look at how you can refuel the body. You could go to bed at 10 p.m. so that you can get up refreshed at 7 a.m., so that would mean if you're tempted to watch Netflix after 10 p.m., well, then you're compromising this, right? So that's, again, about the discipline. Go to bed at 10 p.m. Um, this is just an example. Obviously, if you want to go to bed at 9 p.m. or whatever, that's up to you. It's an example. You could also say, I'll go for a 30-minute walk three times a week. And that would be a way to refuel the body Going for a walk, you might think, oh, that takes energy, but no exercise in the long run give, gives you energy. Also, you could be saying to refill my body, let me not put such a strain on it with all the sugar I'm eating. So I'll only eat sugar at the weekends. So let me see in the comments. I find when I focus in one area, I get a lot done. Okay. All right. Yes, it's about getting started. Okay, lovely to hear that. Eight or nine hours of sleep. Brilliant. So good. So that's how you can find ways to refuel your energy in your body. So emotions. Let's say you get irritable. And I know from the assessment I sent out and lots of you uh, said or, or answered it. So I don't know who answered what because I didn't want to be that snoopy. So I just get the results of what people have answered. And lots of you did say that you were irritable. Uh, you got grumpy, right? So you could tell yourself, well, instead, when I feel irritable, because you just do, instead of stuffing that irritable feeling down with a snack, let me listen to three songs or two, uh, two songs for three minutes. Let me divert my mind onto something nice. So instead of lashing out at somebody, I'll just chill out with some music, right? That will refuel you, your favorite music. I, I think the power of music on emotions is immeasurable, but that's another subject I won't go into. Uh, you could also tell yourself, I'll make sure to connect with all my family members at least once a day, saying something kind to them asking them a question about their day. That's about that deep connection that we all want to feel. So if you're telling yourself, oh, my family never asked me questions about how my day went, start off by asking them. It will create the connection, perhaps not the first time you ask them, but over time, right? Nurturing that connection. Don't just take them for granted. If you feel they take you for granted, well, think about, well, how can I make them feel so special that they want to know more about me, talk with me, spend time with me, sit with me, right? You could also tell yourself, I scheduled two hours to myself in my timetable to craft something with my hands. I mean, how regenerating is it when you create something 
Maybe you create with words, maybe you create with food, maybe you create, you know, taking photos or whatever it is for you. But I just find that using my hands, I, I love that. And I feel that, wow, it's just an outlet where everything just gets reset because I'm, I'm not overthinking it. I'm doing something that takes my attention off what's going on in my mind and onto something very practical. So I love that. Okay, your thing is trying to eat earlier. Okay. New habit of walking 2.5 miles. Wow, well done. I think also walking is very, very regenerating. Also with your mind, right? If you can stop yourself from overthinking or or having those imagine imaginary arguments or thinking about oh I really should have said that and then going over the whole conversation if you can divert your mind off from that and just get into the motion of the body I think that's really like a meditation on the subject of mind and spirit on the worksheet or in the workbook you could tell yourself, okay, I'll give myself limited windows to go on social media. So I'm turning off my notifications. I'm not paying attention to it, except let's say from 12 till half past 12. Like you set yourself windows. So the rest of the time, you're not focusing on that. And when you do focus, well, you can do it wholeheartedly. You can really look at what your friends are posting or, or whatever is going on for you on social media. You can also tell yourself, I'm doing a training. Let me just choose now to prioritize the training and I'll schedule in time to do it every week. So I, I talk about trainings because I'm always doing a training or some for, form of uh, education because I just love continued learning. So um, sometimes I, I notice that, oh, actually it's, it hasn't become, it's no longer a priority. Let me just move it up in my priority list. So I actually spend time with it. So um, that also refuels me, my mind, my spirit, my intellect, all of that. And I enjoy learning. Um, could also tell yourself, I'll take a break at work every two hours where I'll get up from my chair, walk up and down three flights of stairs and then drink a glass of water. Um, that refuels too. It gets your mind off work. When you get back to work, you can be more efficient. And many, many studies show that our attention span is actually limited. We think it will be efficient to work four hours straight. Only nobody can concentrate for four hours straight every day. So we need to create those breaks. And statistically speaking, after 90 to 120 minutes, we need to take a break. And it's not the length of the break that determines how, how well you regenerate that energy. It's actually the quality. So it's not quantity, it's quality. So whatever you choose to do in your break, here I'm focusing on a little bit of physical um, refueling of energy with the work, uh, with the walk and the water. But it could be listening to music or looking at beautiful photos of your family or talking to a coworker or anything like that. So if you've got any other takes on that, I'd love to know. But just know that in your workbook, these are things you can do. It's not a, a whole big list of things you must do. It's just so that you have a little bit of choice here. So if you couple that with the... Um, the assessment I invited you to take. Well, you can see, oh, my energy draining is going on in, let's say, um, in the emotional department. Here are three ways I can remedy that. So instead of draining my emotions here, I will be refueling. Do you see how it works? But you're not committing to anything. You're just looking for possibilities. You're just coming up with ideas. You're brainstorming in some way. So any questions on that? Maybe I'm going a bit too quickly, but I've, I always put too much content in. But anyway, I hope this is useful. Um, so waiting for your questions to come in, maybe I could talk to you about um, a client I had. So uh, I also coach men, but many more women than men. And 
he, this client in particular, he had his family tell him that they didn't feel he was really connecting with them. They felt he was very absent-minded. So absent-minded. So even when he was there, he wasn't really fully there. And so he took that to heart and kudos to him. And instead of getting defensive about it, he said, well, what if they're right? What can I do? So together we sort of created um, health ritual, an energy refueling system, which had him get up just 15 minutes earlier and he wanted to do a workout. So he had uh, weights, he lifted for 15 minutes in the morning. And after that, he took time to have breakfast with his family. So that was, he had two children, oh, he still does. So he was having breakfast with them every morning and that just creates a lot of comfort for children or these were teenagers, but just knowing that their dad was going to be there almost every morning and they had that moment just to exchange a few ideas, say hello and just be together, right? That's so important for children. So he did that. Also, um, he went to work. He worked the same number of hours, but he took a lot more time off. Also, the first hour at work, he told all his colleagues that he was not to be disturbed unless there was an emergency. So he had that whole hour, and that might not sound like a lot to you, but this was like a busy man. Uh, so in the first hour of the day, he knew he had zero interruptions. And actually... There was never an emergency. People could always wait. So during that time, he really got not the urgent stuff done, but the important stuff done. Do you see what I mean? Because we're sometimes so busy with what's urgent that we forget to build on what's important and get on with what is important to us. In the long term, in the short term, but also in the long term, it's so much easier to focus on the short term because there's something burning somewhere. So we're putting out the fires. So he had that whole hour and in the afternoon, he took time to go for a walk. Well, first of all, at lunch, he didn't have lunch in, at his desk. He went and had lunch with one of his colleagues and they actually had a conversation. And then he also took the liberty of a walk in the afternoon because again, he's refueling. And all of that just connected him more to himself and it sort of had him slow down, at least in his mind. So when he got back in the evening, he was much more available to his family. So that that sort of turned everything around. He also lost, I think it was seven kilos, right? Just from, from that extra exercise and not stuffing something down his throat at, at his desk at work, if you see what I mean. So we've got all these possible refueling things we can do. And once we have got more energy, well, then we are much more likely to look at what we want to get done and stop the procrastination because we feel better. Like that good night's rest will have us feel much more positive the next day. And this is the same principle. So let me know if you've got any questions. I can't see any coming up. But so now we've diagnosed a lot, we've come up with some ideas. Let's move to step three, which is shifting our beliefs. So it's not, let's take weight loss. It's not, I either stuff my face with everything that gets inside of me, or I only eat green vegetables and protein, right? There's everything in between. It's not either, I clear out my whole house and everything is spotless and tidy, or I do nothing. There's everything in between, right? Then there was the job, looking for a new job. Well, it's not, I do everything. I redo my CV, I contact all possible employers. I'm out there every day working 10 hours to get a new job and sitting at home doing nothing. There's everything in between. And there's having that conversation with your husband scolding him, telling him off, uh, potentially ruining your marriage or your relationship and doing nothing, that's everything in between. So I hope you're with me on, on this. And the same thing with belief. It's not, I either fully believe this is the answer or I don't believe it at all. There's everything in between. I can, I can believe 40%, I can believe 60%, I can believe 80%, that's everything is possible. It's not either or, it's not 100% or 0%. So, oh, 
Did I just go back? In in um, our workbook, I can't remember the page. Did I say the page? Page three. Page three in the workbook, we're going to look at your old belief, the one we diagnosed or we created awareness around in step one. Step three is to take that old belief to remember, in my example, it was I can't lose weight permanently. And we create a new belief. Maybe I can lose weight permanently with the right help. So we are not saying I can't lose weight and I definitely can lose weight. It's not all or nothing. They're not opposites. They can be somewhere along the way to I've already lost all the weight I want to lose. Maybe I can lose weight. So an old belief is this, the new belief you're looking to create is something that is believable to you right now. Maybe, just maybe, there is a way. I've just not found it yet. Maybe there's a way. You see what I mean? So it's not this mantra thing where we start saying things we don't believe. This is totally believable. It's just a tiny shift, if you see. The old belief was, in my example, the job is too big for me for tidying a house. The new belief is, if I focus on one little task, as a participant said here, one little task at a time, I can start with the kitchen drawers. So you can just go to one kitchen drawer, sort that out. When I do, when I do that, I create instant satisfaction because after that, I sit back. And I just enjoy, wow, so much tidiness in that kitchen drawer. Right? It's a new belief. It's not all or nothing. It's a tiny shift. Do you get me? The tiny shift. It's something you can believe right here, right now. The example uh, with the job hunt is I'm unwilling to hear a no from people I ask for help from. Yeah, I don't want to hear no. I don't want to feel rejection. The new belief could be if people say no to me, it could just be because they don't have the time or think themselves capable. And no doesn't necessarily mean what I make it believe no, mean. Don't know what I was saying. There's something in between belief and mean. So we sometimes make a no mean rejection, but it could be meaning something completely different. That has got nothing to do with us. The old belief was, with the husband and the television, he won't agree with me, and this will create insurmountable problems in my marriage. The new belief is, he might be surprised, and it could create tension, but maybe we could reinvent our marriage. So, tiny shift. There's a possibility here. So, on to you now to create your success formula, which is, we take... Um, the new beliefs, and then we create the, the conditions that will make it possible. So when we see what we can do to create the result we want, when we can see, oh, I can take these action steps towards it, then it's even easier to believe. So ask yourself, in my example for the weight loss, here's how I can lose weight. So I have never, ne never developed a consistency with weight loss. With consistency, everybody can lose weight. If I start exercising regularly, I probably lose fat. There's a form of exercise out there that I like. Let me go out and discover it. So you're just building on your belief. Well, if I can lose weight, what would it look like? Right? Here's how, how I can bring order into my house. If I start in the kitchen and do one drawer at a time, I'll get through them. I can set boundaries with the kids and teach them how to tidy up. I'm a fan of that, implicating everybody in the household. When I buy something new, I have to get rid of something old. This could be my new rule. So do you see how you work on your belief by creating something plausible that you feel you could do? Here's how I can get a new job. People would hire me because I'm punctual, conscientious, skilled at whatever it is you're skilled at, and I've got an excellent track record. Right? Tell yourself in what way you are extraordinary. 
You don't need to tell anybody. It's just for you. It's for your mindset. It's for your belief. You can always also tell you, that tell yourself that people love to help out and you'd be happy to help in return. So you're asking for help, but you'd be happy to help. My time is now. There will never be a better time because right now I've got all the support I need. So do you see how you build your belief with this? And then here's how I can have fun with my husband. If I let him know that I'm not criticizing, that I'm looking for a solu solution, he'd hear me out. Maybe he wouldn't. I can find out other things to do that both of us like doing. I could start talking about the things I like and listen to him talking to me. So more communication, finding things you enjoy, because it's so easy just to get stuck in a routine, isn't it? Especially if you've been married a long time. So think about how you could freshen all this up. And I think there's a difference between telling somebody, I'm so bored with you, and telling them, look, I think we could spice this up. Let's think of ways in which we could do something fun together in the evenings, don't you? I mean, it's not all or nothing. There's so, so much in between the, the all or nothing. My point here is, and I'm just going to look at the time, when you shift your self-concept from somebody who waits, who procrastinates, who complains, to one who takes action, who is determined to get the results she desires, who is resourceful, skilled at what she does, somebody who doesn't take no for an answer, then most things become possible, probable, inevitable. So if you stop thinking of yourself, of somebody who's always waiting to get things done, who is telling herself, I can't, or it's not possible, when you shift that in to somebody who's not stressed out, that she's just very resourceful and very capable. And she knows how to move herself into the mindset where she will get things done. What would your life be like when you become her? Think about it. Isn't that so interesting? Well, what would my life be? Be like when I become her. I love thinking about that. What would my life be like? I think that's so inspiring to be thinking of. So ask me any questions. I've walked you through the workbook. You can do this work afterwards, obviously. There will be a replay, um, which I will be posting very soon. So you can go over it again. My idea here was just to give you those three steps that I take myself through when there's something I feel very resistant to doing. Like, okay, what is it that I'm really resisting? What am I really believing it? Because if we don't believe that the outcome, that's what somebody else said at the beginning, if I don't believe that the outcome is what I want it to be, then why should I be taking any action? It doesn't make sense, right? So <clears throat> play with it. There is no right way or wrong way, but I hope you get it that it's working on your belief, being firm in your belief that will um, not, I don't want to say motivate you, but that will really inspire you. Because if you can believe that it's possible, then you want to get on with it, right? And I can absolutely support you in this. And I would invite you to take action straight away, because what will happen now is that you, you feel so motivated right? Because you've been listening to me for almost an hour and you've got ideas and you think, oh yeah, this sounds fun. So you decide to go to bed at uh, 10 at night, get up at 6.30 and do your exercise. But then you've got a party. You go to the party, you get home late, you go to bed late, you put on the snooze button in the morning and you don't get up, you don't do your exercise. You think, oh, it's not a big deal. Um, I'll do it tomorrow, but then tomorrow you end up sitting on the sofa, eating a lot of ice cream, and you think, oh, I feel disgusted with myself. And then when the, the alarm goes off in the morning, well, you don't feel like getting up and you press the snooze button again and you don't get your exercise, right? It's so difficult to be consistent because we're breaking a habit and we're trying to cultivate a new one. So, that can be really, really difficult. And when we lapse, like 
we start doing something and then we meet with failure because we lapse into our old habits and that is normal. So let's just not beat ourselves up about it. Let's just recognize, oh, I just fell off. Let me get back on. And that is really where I can be very helpful to you. So if you're here live, I would invite you to click on the link I just put in a chat where you will be able to get on a consult with me. And this is your first step if you really want to take this further. So on this consult, we will look at what is stopping you? What is the belief that is stopping you from doing what it is you want to do? So there's a belief, and I mentioned earlier that there's also an emotion probably that you are reticent or that you don't want to feel. What is that emotion? It can sometimes be difficult to find out, but I'm sure I can find it out for you. And when you look at it, when you look at that emotion, you don't want to feel it, but when I help you see a way of actually feeling it without you feeling afraid, when you know how to process it, well, then maybe you'd be willing to. So there are countless of examples of how, how we are avoiding doing something by, by the fear, really, of the emotion. So maybe that's also what somebody else was talking about earlier, the emotion that could be part of the outcome that we don't want. So let's say that I'm thinking, oh, I want to go and post on Instagram. Um, and that feels scary because I feel like I could be ridiculous because I'm not very cool and I don't really know how to post on Instagram and I don't know what to post about. So what is the emotion I'm avoiding here? It's embarrassment, perhaps, right? So if I really want to go and post on Instagram, then I have to be willing to feel the embarrassment, if you see what I mean. There's some emotion underlying here that I'm somehow avoiding, right? So I can help you spot that on a consult. So we will go through what it is you want to do. We'll see what is getting in the way and what you have been trying to do to compensate for it that's frankly not really helping you. And that's not getting you to where it is you want to be. So we'll take all that apart and I will be able to tell you what you could do instead. So that is so useful. I'm just reading the comments again. Okay. Uh, yes, well, if you can't open the invitation, I'll be sending out an email and you can just share the email with him or tell him to get in touch with me, right. Right, you're welcome. Yeah, so if you book a consultation with me, it will help you see what you're doing, which is really demanding an effort of you and which might not be very useful for getting you to where it is you want to be, right? It, it's very difficult from the inside to see exactly what's going on. And that's, what, that's why it's so useful to speak to somebody about it. Speak to somebody about what it is they can see from the outside so that you can stop doing what it is you're doing that's not really working and start doing something that is. Like another example I can give of, of overcoming, like really just challenging the stories we're telling ourselves is uh, another client of mine, let's call her Susie. Her name isn't Susie, but I don't want anybody to be able to recognize her. She had something she didn't want to tell her husband because she had gone to an exhibition and she had commissioned a painting. And um, she was really afraid of talking or telling her husband that she spent that amount of money. So she was just postponing it and postponing it, but she knew that he would find out, right? When the money had gone, he would find out, he would know. And she was just, she was just dreading having to tell him because she was making up the story that he would tell her that she, she was irresponsible with money. So I asked her, well, are you irresponsible with money? And she said, well, maybe not because I am the one who handles the family budget and I manage it perfectly. So I said, well, you're not irresponsible with money. So tell me about why you went ahead and commissioned a painting. I mean, it's not something she did like usually, but she said she'd been to this um, exhibition and 
there were some paintings that really made her think of her holiday home. She had gone on holiday with her aunts uh, and her mum sometimes joined them to this holiday home where she spent the best summers of her childhood. And when she talked to the artist, she said she did commissions from photographs. And so she said, oh, I would so love to have a painting that would remind me of those holidays and particularly of my mum, because her mum had died, and of all the good times they spent together. So she was really moved. That was really what inspired her to, to make the commission. So in the moment, she felt so good about it because she was just thinking of the painting. Oh, I'll have this painting and that will make me think of the good times. Not that she was in particularly bad times, but it's always good to surround yourself with things that make you happy. So she'd done it and she said, well, maybe I shouldn't have. And I said, well, why not? She said, well, it was so impulsive. And I said, oh, tell me about it. Tell me, why was it impulsive? She said, well, I just commissioned it there and then. So, well, did you have a photo of your holiday house on you? She said, no, no, I had to send that on later. So, well, so it wasn't impulsive, right? It was just you answering your desires. You commissioned the, the painting and then later on, you took more action on it, right? You sent off the photo and you, you discussed the size, the, the rendering and all of it, right? So it's not really impulsion. So what is it? It's, well, she just said, well, it's really just that feeling of reconnecting with my mum. So I said, well, what do you think your husband would say to you when he learns that you invested in something that will remind you of happy days with your mum? Do you think you'll be upset? He said, well, maybe not. So that empowered her to go and tell her husband that she had commissioned this painting and she was going to spend money on it. And you know what? He wasn't even asking about the money. He was saying, oh, where shall we hang it? And how do you see that? And he was just really interested in the painting. And so you see, we have these beliefs that sometimes prevent us from, or always prevent us from taking action. And it's a, so good to clear them up. So going deep in this, in this work, like doing the three steps could be so empowering because it will allow you to well to really understand what's going on and especially what I'm hoping is that it will stop you from thinking that you're not doing something because you're not fit to do it you can't do it somebody mentioned starting her online business I mean I've got an online business I can't think of anything more appropriate to do really so um think about what is it really so you also mentioned about the online business that your family think you are crazy, right? So that's also something we can dive into. But I would really encourage you to make an appointment with me. I don't want to say your name in case you want to be anonymous. But your online business is so possible. Let's dive into why that is, right? Let's, let's work on your beliefs. What is so inspiring on these consults is when you start believing because right now I believe in you and you might think so what but it's so good to talk to somebody who believes in in you that you can do what it is you want to do right it's so good to talk to people um who are not talking things down because well when like you said your family think you're crazy Maybe it's just that they can't see themselves doing it and they're afraid you might get hurt. You might get hurt because you fail, but why not make sure you won't fail? And I believe the only way to fail is to give up. Like you can't avoid setbacks in life. There will always be setbacks, but you don't have to interpret them as a failure, right? The only failure is when you stop trying. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. No time's available. Oh, can I just invite you to try again at some other time? Because I'm sure that, ah, oh, I opened up times on Saturday, really, to accommodate everybody. And that's a little bit unusual for me to be working on Saturday. But I thought, 
I thought it could be helpful. I get the same answer. No times are currently available. Okay, so let me just put my email in the chat, my email address, so you can send me an email and I will send you, or I'll be in touch with you. Let's clear this up. Thank you for telling me it's not working. I mean, how dreadful. I don't think all the times have been snapped up. That's not possible. So send me an email and we'll sort this out, right? And if somebody else couldn't uh, find a time, if it's said to you that there are no times available, don't believe it, we'll sort it out. Send me an email, get in touch with me. You can also just reply to the email that goes out with the replay. I'll put another link in and hopefully technology will be with us. So go ahead. Oh, I've got a question here. Any tips for unsureness and tentativeness? Yes. So if you are unsure, I would dive into that. But please book. I mean, we can do that on a consultation. What is coming up is when you feel unsure and tentative, it's that you're telling yourself there is one right way. There's one right action. There's one right way of doing something. I have to find it. And you think, oh, I might not know it. I might do something that is wrong. But when you really tell yourself that there are a million ways of doing something, if that is true, well, let's not say million, but let's say in your case, there are 10 ways of doing something. Well, what if you started off with one way, you tried it out, you were willing to fail, meaning you were willing not to be met with the outcome that you were talking about earlier. You were willing not to instantly have that outcome happen and then try another way. But um, this is very, um, very sort of hypothetical. So it'd be much more useful if you just went ahead and booked a consult. So when you go on a consult with, with me, it, you're not telling me I want to coach with you forever right? You're just saying, I could really use your help with this. Could you help me work this out? That's what you're telling me. And I would love to meet up with you. So you're more than welcome. Yeah. Uh, so please feel free. I love meeting people. I love diving into what's getting in your way. And I think just one console like that will really show you what, what is possible. And that is so good to know when you find out, oh, I want to do this. And not only is that possible, it's actually much easier than I thought it would be. And if this is possible, maybe that is possible. Right? It's just opening your mind up to everything that's available to you. I mean, how delicious is that? So I would highly encourage you. You're welcome. Highly encourage you to book a consult with me. Who knows? You might have not just your first step ready, you might have the next three steps ready and you might have a plan. Because another thing our brain does is, oh, I don't know where to start. I must have a plan. I must know that I do this and that is what could be getting in your way. I don't, I was almost said your name. This is what could be getting in my way. I don't want to risk it. So let me not do it. So if I do this, I don't know what to do next. But my point is, when you take your first step, like getting on a consult with me, once you've taken that step, then you will know your second step. Once you've taken your second step, you will know your third step, etc. So when we start up, when we start out, we don't know how to get to our end goal. We will find that out. But if we're not willing to get started, then we won't find out. And I also sent out um, an email, I don't know whether you read it, about the five stages of change. So if you're just here listening and you don't want to take any action, that's completely normal. You're just in stage two. You're in contemplation, which is already good, right? You don't have to force yourself to take action. Forcing yourself to do something that you profoundly don't believe in will create failure, right? You have to believe before you take the action. You have to believe that this is a possible right action. It's not the only right action. It's one of them. When you believe that, 
then taking that action is so much easier and it will influence your results. If you take action from the idea, this won't work, it probably won't work. You see what I mean? And when you take action from the idea, this could very well work. I'm not 100% sure, but like I believe 80% that this could work. Well, then you take action that will actually probably create success. Would you agree with me on that? Yeah, right? I remember an instance from my childhood because I told myself, you're not good at throwing a ball. And in lots of children's games, you have to throw a ball, right? And that was the story. That was my identity. I didn't know how to throw a ball. And we were playing a game. And I think I was right around 11 or 12. And I just moved from being a leader at school to being like ignored because I was so uncool. So I thought, let me just throw that ball really well now. Let me just do it. I'm taking on the identity of somebody who knows how to throw a ball. And I threw the ball and it was brilliant. And I thought, what just happened there? Isn't that strange? How did that happen? <laughs> right? So weird. So I think that when we take action from a belief, then that action is so much more powerful than we take when we take the same action from disbelief. <laughs> Thank you. So I used to be a school teacher. And at the start of my career, I would go into the classroom thinking, I don't know what I'm doing. So I don't know whether anybody can relate to that. And of course, uh, the result was that I didn't come across very well. So a few years into my career, I went into the classroom thinking, I know exactly what I'm doing. And that showed. So instead of having a classroom full of children who are hopping around all over the place and screaming and, and doing all sorts of things, I had students who were sitting down paying attention insofar that they were capable right? So it's all about what you believe and what you believe will, will show up in how you behave, won't it? I can totally do this. I can totally start my own business online. Who are they to tell me? Right? Let me show them. I believe 80% of the time that this is totally doable, right? I accept that 20% of the time I lose faith. I don't believe 100%. That's just normal because I've never actually done it before. And my brain wants proof that I can do it. The only way I can create proof for myself is seeing me doing it. But the problem is that will never happen till you've actually done it. So we have to be willing to take the first step somehow. Take the first step, whatever that is, and see what happens. But don't take a scary step. Take a step where you feel, oh, this might actually work. Do you see what I mean? So you're not pushing yourself out of your, wildly out of your comfort zone. You're right at the edge where it feels uncomfortable, but you're not paralyzed with fear. And our last workshop was on how to get out of your comfort zone. And I think there's some helpful um, tips in that how you can be on that edge where things feel mm, uncomfortable. So when they feel uncomfortable and you do them, you are actually growing. So when you do things that are wildly scary, you're just uh, augmenting really. You're, you're making the chances of failure greater. So I think don't do anything that is hugely scary. Believe in it first, believe in the outcome. And I don't know whether that speaks to you. Believe in the outcome first before you take any action. So as you said, you are unsure, you are tentative. Well, why? What is the belief behind that? Let's deal with that first. Let's remove the belief that is creating the uncertainty, the tentativeness. Let's 
Let's limit that. Let's get that out of the way. Let's put a different belief in there from where you can take action. And as I said, it's not all or nothing. It's not, I don't think this will ever work. Or I know this will work. You can be somewhere in between. Am I making sense? Good. Great. Um, does anybody, maybe I should just stop the recording here because I think I'm just waffling now. So if you are here on the replay, uh, thank you for staying on till the end. I'd love to connect with you. So go ahead, book a consult, which you will find a link to either in the email that I'm sending out with the replay or under this video. So I'm stopping the recording, but I'm staying on. Bye for now.